Where do we get our new herbs for our catalog? Stay tuned and I'm going to tell you our secrets. Welcome to Richter's Seminars. This video presentation is from a series of free educational seminars on herb and garden topics offered each year at Richter's. As a grower of herbs, I'm often asked, where do you get your new herbs? Over the years, we've introduced many herbs that have gone on to become wildly popular with gardeners, cooks, and herbalists. Today, I'm going to tell you some of our secrets, where we find our new herbs, and how we make them available to gardeners and commercial growers. It helps to remember a little school biology. Plants make our prospecting easy because of their natural tendency to mutate. Remember Darwin's theory of evolution and the idea that plants and all organisms continuously mutate and rearrange their genetic code to create new forms. Usually the mutations are small and unnoticeable, but every once in a while a plant will mutate into a very noticeable form. This is natural mutation, occurring without the help of humans. It is possible to artificially induce mutations using certain chemicals or radiation, but this is not what we do at Richter's. And we really don't have to because the plants are mutating all the time. It just takes a keen eye to find them. Here's a rather grotesque mutation of yellow coneflower. Somebody call it mutant ninja coneflower. Coneflower has this ability to produce crazy new forms that are wildly different from the normal daisy flowers with brown centers and ringed by yellow petals. The first thing that comes to my mind when I look at this is a giant worm engorging itself at the expense of a hapless flower. Well, sometimes nature's ideas for change are not particularly appealing or marketable. I should add that yellow coneflower is an old Indian remedy for chest pains, wounds, fever, and poison ivy. Here is another American healing plant, Echinacea purpurea, the common purple coneflower. Look at this freaky thing with the bizarre petals sticking out the middle of a flower. I'm not sure that anybody other than a bee could love this thing. Echinacea is, of course, an immunostimulant herb with the native, which the Native Americans used to use to ward off colds. A more appealing mutation that you will often see in garden plants is variegation. This is a mutation in which some cells fail to produce chlorophyll, the green pigment that is essential for photosynthesis. These cells end up looking yellow or even white. Sometimes this variegation is not a mutation at all, but it is a result of a virus infection. Some variegated mints have viruses, and when cuttings are taken from them, the new plants are variegated also, because the virus lives on in the new plant. So not all viruses are bad. A number of years ago, a fantastic new form of basil was introduced to the home garden market, and it quickly became popular, showing up in nurseries everywhere. It was a chance mutation of this plant, the Lesbos basil. Lesbos basil is an old variety that was found on the Greek island of Lesbos, and it has a sweet lemony scent and an amazing ability to grow on and on without dying off at the end of a summer like regular basil. When regular basils flower and go to seed, that triggers a switch in the plant that turns on the plant's senescence mode, the mode of shutting down and eventually dying. For many annual plants, producing seeds is the main purpose in life, and there's no need to live on after that. Immortality is not the quest of regular basils. But this Lesbos basil is different. It does not flower and does not trigger the senescent switch. And the plant can grow on for years, proving that immortality does exist 
if you push the right genetic button. The fantastic new basil I mentioned is this one, Pesto Perpetuo. It is a mutation of Lesbos. It was found in a flat of Lesbos basil grown at a nursery in the United States called Sunny Border Nurseries. The owners knew they had something special and they immediately registered a plant, pa a plant patent for it in the U.S. This plant is immensely popular with gardeners, not only for its wonderful scent and flavor, but also for its classy look, with its dense columnar shape and silvery foliage. One can imagine that the owners threw in the perpetual part of the name as a nod to the perpetual growth habit inherited from Lesbos Basil. Here you can see Lesbos and Pesto Perpetual compared. Of course, because the plant rarely flowers, it cannot be propagated by seeds. So instead, this variety is propagated by cuttings. Each plant, in theory, is identical to the mother plant. As mentioned, the owners got a patent for this plant. It is really quite remarkable that a natural mutation could become such a hit like this. I always encourage gardeners to keep their eyes open. You never know if the next big thing is growing in your garden. Another way to develop new varieties is by cross-pollination. When the pollen of one plant is placed on the stigma of another plant, you get cross-pollination. If the parent plants are different in some way, then the resultant hybrids may or may not have interesting new features, such as a new flower color, or a new leaf shape, or a new aroma. You can find hybrids everywhere. Many of the most popular vegetables and flowers are hybrids. There are two kinds of hybrids. One is the intentional or artificial hybrids produced when a breeder deliberately crosses plants in search of better plants. The other is the natural hybrids that results when two plants in close proximity cross naturally with the help of bees or the wind to carry pollen from one flower to another. Often these natural hybrids show up in the garden as seedlings and if they are lucky they grow up, get noticed and become startling new varieties and maybe make someone a lot of money. This incredible echinacea was developed from a series of intentional crosses between different varieties of echinacea. The seeds of the crosses were planted and the progeny were closely observed by the breeder. Among probably thousands of individuals from those crosses, the breeder have identified this plant and how impressive it is. The echinaceas normally feature purples, pinks, and white, but with deliberate crossing, the breeder was able to come up with a brand new color and named the new variety t tomato soup, perhaps inspired by a famous brand name soup that we all know. Far more common in the herb world are the natural hybrids. Many of the scented geraniums are natural hybrids, for example. Scented geraniums are very pop were very popular in Victorian times, and when two different varieties or species were grown close together, a little hanky-panky invariably occurred, and new forms would spring up out of the ground where the seeds fell. Likewise, this basil, profusion basil, was found in the backyard garden of a customer of ours. She was probably growing several types of basil, perhaps a Genovese and a miniature bush type, and lo and behold, up sprung a beautiful low, compact, bushy variety which we christened profusion basil. We offered it for a few years in our catalog, but unfortunately our mother plants eventually succumbed to the senescence fate that I talked about earlier, and we lost it. But I tell this story because I like to show that even an amateur gardener can come up with a spectacular new variety. Here's the latest new basil to make it in our catalog. 
This is emerald wine basil. This was observed growing in a flat of seedlings and we fell in love with its beautiful emerald leaves dripping with red wine. The growth habit is compact and bushy and the overall look is very attractive in pots. I think this is going to be a real hit. But probably it will be a short-lived variety like Perfusion Basil because it too flowers and sets seeds. We don't know who the parents are, but we are guessing that purple bush basil is one of them, and maybe a green leaf, small leaf basil is the other. But again, this is an example of a natural hybrid that only needed a pair of open eyes to discover. A third way to come up with new varieties is by selection. Remember I said that plants mutate. Well, it turns out that they do that a lot, even under our noses. If we look at a field of carrots or peppers, we may not think there is much difference between one plant and another. But in fact, there usually is, if the plants were grown from seeds. Some species show more variability than others, but there's always some natural variation. Breeders can take advantage of that by purposefully selecting plants with specific features from among a field of plants. Sometimes it takes growing many generations of plants for the breeder to get the characteristics he or she is looking for. Or, as is sometimes the case, a brand new variety is staring at him, at him or her right in the face and that single plant can be multiplied by cuttings and sold as a new variety. So, with selection, the variability is already there in the plants, and it is the breeder who is sifting through all the individual plants and picking the ones that will become new varieties. Now, this process of selection can also occur in nature, which is what we all know as natural selection. When a breeder is picking plants to create a new variety, then it is called artificial selection. And when a stupid biker self-destructs, that's called idiot selection. Here I am standing in a field of the back of a Richter's property. I'm looking at a patch of oregano, which I had discovered just a few days before the picture was taken. You can see the low oregano plants growing amongst the grasses and other plants. This was an amazing discovery. I was out for a walk on a fine summer day and was standing in this area and noticed an incredible aroma all around me. I was instantly transported to Greece where I traveled many years ago looking for herbs. I remembered vividly the sensual aromas everywhere I walked in the wild meadows. Just walking on the foliage release the aromatic, volatile oils that soon engulf you as you walk. And so it was like that when I stood in this patch of, of oregano growing in this field. This oregano had to be a survivor of more than 25 years of competition with the local grasses and wild plants, because it was more than 25 years ago that my father planted seeds in that field. He planted seeds that could no longer be sold because of low germination. He wanted to see what would come up. And in that mix of old seeds was some oregano from Greece. Very likely, almost all of the oregano plants that came up died that first winter because Greek oregano is not particularly hardy. But probably one plant out of perhaps millions had just the right genetic makeup to be hardy enough to survive the Canadian winter and hardy enough to compete against the native flora that eventually moved into the area after my father's death. We dug up some and now we're making thousands of new plants from those mother plants. We call this new variety Perfusion Oregano. So this process of one seedling surviving against all odds is a perfect example of natural selection at work. In our greenhouses we often find interesting things, where again a keen eye pays off. 
We do thousands of seed tests every year. Our seed test process includes a step where we sow the seeds in test boxes like the ones you see in this slide. Other seed companies are content with knowing what the germination and purity are from tests typically done in a seed test lab. But we also want to know that the seeds coming up are the right varieties. Over the years we have seen many seed lots that were the right species but not the right variety. And really the only way to be sure is to grow the seed out and see what you get. If the seedlings don't have the right scent or the right shape then Richter's does not sell that lot of seeds. But in the course of doing these many seed box tests, we sometimes see some interesting things among the seedlings. One year we noticed a couple of unusual looking seedlings in a time test box. When we looked a little closer, we noticed that those two seedlings among the hundreds had an unusual orange scent. Not only that, the taste was very much like orange peels, in a good way. And the plants proved to be a very nice carpet forming habit, or proved to have a very nice carpet forming habit. We were so excited. We knew we had something special. It eventually made it into our catalog as Orange Spice Time and it has gone on to become one of our most successful introductions ever. Even today it is still growing in popularity more than a decade after we introduced it. You can see how it spreads. Each of these branches develops roots where they touch the soil. Another way that we get new herbs is by repurposing plants. I love the way this old suitcase was repurposed to become a portable picnic table. Well, this is what we sometimes do with plants that are not sold originally as herbs. Case in point, Bloody Dock. We saw this in a perennial seed catalog. It was sold as a hardy ornamental flower. Indeed, it has lovely blood red venation throughout its dark green foliage. We knew that the genus of this plant belonged to, uh, the genus that this plant belonged to has other herbs such as sorrel and yellow dock. So we ordered some seeds to see if it had any herbal potential. It turned out to be quite a find. The leaves have a wonderful tart taste just like sorrel and with the bloody color we saw it as a beautiful new ingredient for fresh salads. And because it is perfectly hardy, Bloody Dock comes back providing a yearly supply of fresh leaves. Now isn't that a great thing to have? Here's another repurposed plant, Vietnamese coriander. When you look in regions of a world where French coriander or fresh coriander or cilantro is a big part of the local cuisine, you often see more than one coriander-like plant in the herbal repertoire. In Mexico, for example, besides the ubiquitous cilantro, you will find culantro, which is also known as Mexican or thorny coriander. Another one is papilo, or papilo keliti. In South Asia, not much to our surprise, one finds related coriander-like plants such as nogai, which is in fact the same culantro plant found in Mexico. Well, many years ago, my good friend, Yen, introduced me to the wonderful world of fresh Vietnamese herbs, and among them was a herb called rao ram that smelled and tasted like fresh coriander. It isn't a perfect copy. Some say it has a soapier taste, taste and the Vietnamese themselves don't use it like cilantro, but it was still pretty close. Because true cilantro is such a pain to grow indoors, you have to reseed it after it harvests because it doesn't regrow, a near copy that keeps coming back after cutting is a very desirable thing for indoor growing. Well, we decided to name this plant Vietnamese coriander and market it as a cilantro substitute. And sure enough, it took off in North America, becoming a staple in many gardens. 
When my parents first started in the greenhouse business, I remember growing this annual plant for its ornamental value in gardens. It was called Signet Marigold, and it came in yellow, orange, and red varieties. Many years later, I came across it again, and I happened to notice, notice something I hadn't noticed before, the scent. Unlike other marigolds commonly grown in flower gardens, the French and African types, which have a foul odor, these marigolds have a lovely, if complex, citrusy aroma. I wouldn't want to say that the aroma is a clean lemon or lime or orange, but it seemed to me that there was a strong enough citrusy note in the scent that the plant had potential. The taste too was citrusy, and it was not offensive like the other marigolds. I thought, why couldn't this be a flavor and herb for salads and desserts? Well, we make the bold move to repurpose this plant as a herb, and in the catalog it went, listed as citrus marigold, and it is still in there today, and now you can find it in cookbooks. The last way we find our new herbs is to cheat a little bit, a kind of cultural plagiarism. We draw upon the incredible wealth of plants from around the world, plants that have never or rarely been grown here, and we study them, and when we think we know them well enough, we add them to our catalog. On our travels, we're always on the lookout for plants, and we've brought back many interesting ones over the years. But we also travel the world right here in our backyard. Nearby Toronto, just like New York, is a vast melting pot of cultures and each immigrant group has brought its own special plants to use in cooking and for health. For me, a fun day in the city is to browse the fresh vegetable markets in Kensington Market or in the various Chinese, Indian, African and Caribbean parts of the city. I find that vegetable sellers are usually happy to share their knowledge about their unique plants and over the years we've picked up quite a few new herbs this way. Here is a tiny sampling of the many ethnic herbs we have added to our catalog over the years. African paracress comes from my wife's home village in Ghana, in West Africa. This is one of several related species that produce a tingling sensation in the mouth when chewed fresh. In fact, <clears throat> the yellow flowers of a related species is currently being marketed to high-end restaurants in Europe as electric buttons for fresh use in salads. Top chefs are always, on, always looking for the next great thing to add to their dishes, and this crazy herb that jolts the taste, taste buds certainly fits the bill. While in my wife's village, the carpeting plant you see hugging the trunk of a coconut tree is used in a rather unique way. Whenever anyone needs to be at their persuasive best, in business, in politics, or just among friends and family, chewing a few fresh leaves of this African paracress helps to ensure success. The plant has a mild anesthetic effect, and I suspect the effect ha helps to untie the tongue and makes it easy to get thoughts into words and out the mouth. But please don't tell our politicians about this. We already get quite enough BS from them. In the slide you can also see culantro, the one that I talked about earlier, the coriander-like herb from Mexico and Vietnam. The other herb in the slide is curry leaf, a herb that I first encountered in the Tamil stores of Toronto, where bundles of fresh branches are sold for making the famous doshas of South India. When the leaves are bruised, they have a strong curry aroma. Fresh leaves are absolutely fantastic in soups, stews, and of course curries. With so many ethnic herbs to choose from, it is hard to choose which ones to include in my presentation. But among the many, few have had the impact in North America as our mojito mint. For years, a, many a bartender 
tried to emulate the famous cocktail of Cuba, so loved by Hemingway and by James Bond even. But because of the trade embargo imposed by the government, Americans could not get their hands on the real mojito mint. Instead, they tried to make mojitos from other mints, mostly spearmint varieties, but the result never quite cut it. Canada never went along with America's unneighborly treatment of the Cubans and has always allowed Canadians to vacation in Cuba. One Canadian, a customer of Richter's, while enjoying that last mojito at Havana Airport before leaving, decided to save the sprig of mint in her drink and smuggled it back into Canada. She came to Richter's hoping that we would grow some for her friends to enjoy. But seeing an opportunity, I propose that we would do so provided we get to keep a few plants for ourselves. She readily agreed, and as they say, the rest is history. Because from that little sprig fished out from a drink, millions of plants have been grown and shipped all across North America. At Richter's, it's not just a garden, it's a whole new world. For herb plants, seeds, veggies, and more, visit us at richters.com or call 1-800-668-4372.